Hi, everybody. Welcome to this awesome review of this game. Uh, my name is Dan Wells, and I am an author of horror, science fiction, and fantasy. I am also a gaming nut and love role playing games. And in particular, I dearly, dearly love the game I'm going to talk about today, one of my all time favorites, top three RPG, uh, the One Ring role playing game from Cubicle 7. Um, this game captures not just the world of Middle Earth. There's lots of different places that, uh, lots of different games that uh, deal with Lord of the Rings and with The Hobbit and with, you know, Middle Earth and all of that. The One Ring manages to capture the vibe, the tone, the mood of the books, the books specifically, not the movies, uh, more closely and more lovingly than I've ever seen. Uh, they have some really great mechanics um, that help really bring that out. One of them, for example, uh, there's something called hope. Your two main kind of resources, I guess, that you're managing is endurance, which is kind of sort of like hit points. That's uh, You lose endurance when you're in combat and when you get hit and things like that. And then there's hope. And uh, hope is really at the core of the game in some ways. Uh, as you, you know, fight monsters, as bad things happen, you will lose hope. As good things happen, you will gain hope. Hope is a resource that you can spend to give yourself bonuses, uh, to get through the travel, to get through the, the monsters and the combats and everything. Uh, and so the way that you're able to use hope and kind of hope is what keeps you alive and i just really love that uh so anyway let's talk about the one ring role playing game there are a ton of different supplements for this and over the course of the year i'll be coming back to talk about all of these in detail um there's so many of them but uh today we're talking about the core book uh, which is a nice big thick fat book Lord of the Rings, uh, there it is. Sorry, it's reversed on my screen, and so I don't know what I'm doing. But um, it's really great. I've got the entire library in PDF, but I've got this and uh, one other, The Adventurer's Companion in hardback. Uh, I've also got, uh, this is yet another game that uses proprietary dice. And I always say that I hate proprietary dice, and then I keep recommending games that use proprietary dice. Um, this one basically has a bunch of D6s, and you can absolutely easily and with no problem use normal D6s for this. The only difference on their proprietary versions is that you can see uh, the numbers 1, 2, and 3 are uh, black on a white background. And then 4, 5, and 6, if I can get those displayed properly, 4, 5, and 6 are um, white on a black background. Also, the 6 has a little rune in the corner of it. And there you go. You can kind of sort of see that little rune right there. Um, basically what that means is that when you're rolling your dice, uh, whether it is for a skill check or a combat check or whatever you're rolling for, um, if you are weary, then the one, two, and the three don't count. That's why they're a different color. And so you can totally use normal D6s and it's totally fine. Just remember, oh, I'm weary, so one, two, and three aren't gonna count. And that's a nice mechanic. It's a nice way of showing um, that, you know, you're not down, you're not unconscious, you're not dead, but you are in some way uh, compromised. You're weary. The And weariness can come from combat or it can come from other things as well. That the journey has just been too hard. You're really starting to lose your hope. You're starting to lose your spirit. You're losing your drive. And so things become hard. And the fact that it is the lower numbers on the dice that don't count means that you can still succeed at most checks, right? Uh, if you roll high, then it's just as if you're not weary at all. You rolled great, and that's wonderful. And if all you roll is low numbers, you probably weren't going to succeed at that check anyway. And so the main function that you get is those kind of mid-range rolls where some of your numbers are really high, but some of your numbers are low, and they end up, you know, you just miss it by one or two because you're too weary to accomplish it. And so it's a really nice thing. The other proprietary die that they use is a special D12. 
This one, again, you can absolutely do this with a normal D12, uh, but the conversion is a little trickier. This D12 goes from 1 to 10, but it's got two special runes. It has the Gandalf rune, which is kind of like a critical success, and then it has the Sauron rune, which is like a critical failure. Okay? And so if you just remember when you're rolling your dice, oh, 11 means Gandalf and 12 means Sauron, then you can use a normal D12 and you're totally great. You've got all the right numbers. Uh, and so these are just kind of fun to have. So when you're doing a check, um, well, do I want to explain the dice? Yes, I'm going to explain the dice right now. Um, anytime you do a check, it'll you have a certain number of dice. So let's say that you're trying to make a travel roll and you've got two dice in travel, you roll those two dice plus the 12, and you roll those out, and you get your number, and uh, you, you try to beat target numbers. This is a roll above a target number system. Um, and so that's how it works. And if you if too many people in the party roll Saurons, then bad things can happen. Um, if you totally fail the, the roll, but you still get a Gandalf, you still succeed, because a crit will always succeed. So it's kind of a forgiving system. Its job is not to punish you. Its job is to mimic and replicate that feel in the books um, of, you know, we're just trying to get through this, that we are, you know, the lonely adventurers in the wilderness standing up against the shadow. Um, so let's take a look. Um, I do want to show you some of the character creation options, but before we do that, Let's actually dive right into one of the character sheets. Now, when I pop this up, the uh, card is going to get huge because for some reason, this PDF, when you go to a new page, it makes the page huge and it zooms in on it. So there we go. And let's give you a closer look at that. So here we have a character sheet. This is what a character sheet for the One Ring looks like. Um, every character has a name. They come from a certain culture. Uh, they've got, you know, all these little blessings that they have. And then down here, there's attributes. Attributes in the One Ring do not at all function the way you would expect them to function if you've played any other role-playing game ever. And it took me a while to get my head around this. Um, they apply in a certain number of things. So body, for example, um, it's how strong you are, your physical aptitude. And in most cases, that is going to apply as a damage bonus. Um, and that's the only thing you'll ever use it for. Heart is how you will calculate your endurance and your hope. And that's one of the only things you'll ever use it for. Wits is going to be your parry, how hard it is to hit you. So you can see his body roll here it becomes his damage bonus. His wits becomes his parry, right? And most of what's going on here then is the skills. So say you're going to make a travel roll. Two things means two dice plus the d12. But, and this is where the attributes do come into play. Let's say you roll those and you needed to hit a 15 but you only got a 13, okay? So you failed. What you can do then is spend one of your hope points to add your attribute to the roll. And so you were able to spend hope as a resource to boost your ability to succeed. And uh, that's kind of fun. The favored version here, that is um, for favored skills. And right here, inspire is underlined which means that's one of his favored skills. He's really good at inspiring people. And inspire is a heart skill. And so he rolls three dice, and then if he wants to uh, spend hope, he can add an eight to it instead of just a seven. And so that's what the attributes do. Um, over here on the side, you've got uh, valor and wisdom. And I can talk about those a little bit later. Those are kind of the main form of leveling and experience that uh, as you gain an experience you can you know to some degree improve your skills but a lot of what you're doing is just boosting your wisdom and your valor 
um, you know, valor being combat prowess, wisdom being mental prowess, and those give you extra bonuses, blessings and rewards, okay? And we will get into that a bit later, but now that you have seen a little bit about how the uh, character sheets work and you know how, how the skills work, what do I mean when I say that this game does a really great job of capturing the feel of the books? Well, let me show you a great example in character creation, okay? And so right now I'm going through my bookmarks trying to find the, um, the heroes. Do, do, do. So first of all, we've got uh, Bjornings here. Let's look at Bjornings. Um, the game is set by default in between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And it is also kind of by default set in and around Mirkwood. Um, this, you know, this is uh, right after the necromancer has been cast out of, uh, of of Mirkwood. And so while there are certainly parts of Mirkwood that are horrible, it hasn't fully fallen to the shadow yet the way that it has 50, 60 years later when Lord of the Rings starts. And so it's kind of, uh, you know, we're far away from Rohan, we're far away from Minas Tirith, uh, we're relatively far away from um, Rivendell. But what we do have is we've got the Bardings, the people who live in Lake Town. We've got Bjornings, which are kind of the um, the people that follow Bjorn, kind of wild people, not wild people, just wilderness people, mountain men, people who live in the in the mountains and in the wilderness by themselves. Some of the other cultures, uh, the Dwarves of the Lonely Mountain, are there, and they are, uh, you know. Uh, Thorin's company has reestablished the Lonely Mountain and Erebor as a functioning kingdom. And then, of course, we have the Elves of Mirkwood. I wish it would just stay zoomed at the level I want it to be. Um, and so you've got all of these kind of functioning things. We've got some extra woodmen and, of course, hobbits of the Shire. And that's all great. Uh, and so as you build the characters, that's kind of who you're playing. Uh, with other expansions, you can be a Rider of Rohan or a Knight of Gondor, or you can be one of the uh, Noldor, a High Elf of Rivendell. Uh, but for the most part, you're just going to be one of these kind of little people who live in the shadows of all of that. You live in Lake Town or in Dale or in Erebor or over on the other side by uh, the House of Bjorn. You live just out in the woods and you're trying to get by. And then let's find, where is it? We gotta find, uh, what I wanna show you specifically is some of the blessings. So wisdom and valor, like I said, they are what will give you certain blessings and rewards as you level up and you will start with one of them, okay? So here we go, cultural virtues. Um, so you will be able to start with one of these things. Um, where are you? There we go. So here's some stuff that the uh, Bjornings are able to take. Brother to Bears. You're able to, um, it gives you an endurance bonus. You can see at night. Uh, there's Night Goer, which lets you sneak around. You can explore things. Um, Skin Coat gives you incredible armor. Great Strength gives you this fantastic parry score, and you can carry all this stuff. And then there's Twice Baked Honey Cakes. For me, when I was first reading through this game, trying to decide what it was about and what it meant, the Twice Baked, twice baked Honey Cakes is what sold me on the game. Because what the Twice Baked Honey Cakes do, you remember in The Hobbit, Bjorn makes honey cakes for the dwarves. And they're like, yay, these are great. These are so refreshing. This is helping us put ourselves together after we've just been through Goblin Town and all these awful things have happened. And this game remembers that, and this game cares about that. And the ability to make great honey cakes and improve your party's fellowship and reduce their fatigue 
is every bit as valuable as having great strength or extra armor or all these extra cool skills. And so that is, for me, a really big part of how this game works to establish that feel. So now let's talk about the travel system, because this is the other thing that I really genuinely love about this game. So when you get a party all together, there's a bunch of different roles. And each character, of course, has their kind of, it's not a class, um, but their kind of archetype that they take, whether they are a, um, uh, a slayer or they are a leader or they are a talker or whatever. Um, so, but then they, they also have roles within the party. And so when you form an adventuring group, you nominate one of them to be your leader, one of them is your scout, one of them is your hunter, uh, and so on. And so as you go through, um, you will decide, you know, you'll figure out, and we'll look at the map in a minute, you'll figure out how long a journey is going to take and how dangerous the journey will be. And then, at, you know, every couple of days, everyone makes a role. And this is kind of an abstracted system. Uh, and so you're not having to role play every step of the journey or even every day of the journey but the gm will just say okay you know based on the the trail you guys are going through um you know the first part is pretty easy you can go four or five days you only need to make one roll and it's going to be a pretty easy travel roll and so everyone makes a travel roll and you know assuming that nobody gets that little sauron then you should be okay but if there's a hazard then something will pop up and you'll be like, okay, you don't have enough food. The hunter has to deal with this hazard to try to get more food. Or you've gotten lost and the uh, the scout has to figure out where you are. And there's a lot of hazards and a lot of this the GM can create. There's a lot of fan supplements out there. Uh, let's take a look at the, boom, the map. Okay, so the core book has several maps. And then all of the expansion books have a bunch more maps that really get into, um, that are all color coded like this. So let's zoom in here a little bit. Uh, so this is Mirkwood over here. We've got uh, Lonely Mountain. This lake right here is uh, the lake. There's Dale, there's uh, Eskaroth, which I think is Lake Town, uh, the cool name for Lake Town. Oh, Bjorn's house is somewhere else. So down here in the key you can see that the color codes relate to how dangerous something is to travel in and so this valley here in between the mountains and Mirkwood is relatively easy so it's going to be pretty normal to travel through there so let's say you want to go from dink let's zoom in a little bit here's Bjorn's house and you want to travel from Bjorn's house to Eskaroth, okay? Well, the first few days of that are going to be pretty easy. You're just going to be traveling through this easy stuff, but then you're going to have to go through Northern Mirkwood. Northern Mirkwood is brown, which means that it is severe. We don't want to get into daunting because that's even worse. So we're going to stay out of these Mirk Mirkwood mountains and we'll maybe go in order to have as quick travel as possible will go up here and you count all the hexes and then you will follow this road because that lets you travel more quickly and you'll count all the brown hexes that you're traveling through and then you'll get out and you'll say well do we want to come through the long marshes which is hard or do we want to take extra time and go through northern dale lands which is easy obviously we're going to go past elven king's hall out through northern dale lands and from there around the marshes and down. And so you'll count all of the hexes and you'll figure out um, you know, what color they are, how dangerous that journey is going to be. And it's very easy at that point to go, well, okay, then we know exactly how many travel rolls you're going to have to make. We know that if you get a hazard, how bad it's going to be. We know the target number you're going to have to hit with your travel rolls, uh, which sounds like you're reducing the travel to a bunch of math. In practice, it really does feel like you're walking through Middle Earth and the group is, you know, pulling together and you're planning your provisions. You go back and you read the books. So much of them are about travel and about 
how are we going to get through this? And about Sam packing a bunch of extra provisions on Bill the Pony so that you can make sure that you have enough so that these problems don't arise. And so an adventure, a scenario that you play play through is going to have this kind of travel phase as you move around. And then when you get where you're going, you'll have an adventuring phase, which is where you'll talk to people and you'll fight some monsters and you'll do whatever you need to do. And then at the end of each scenario, you know, once you've dealt with the problem, you've solved whatever it is, then there is a fellowship phase. And this is another thing that I absolutely love. There's a lot of games. Pendragon, one of my other favorite RPGs, does this same idea, which is where you kind of abstract it out over the course of several years. So, um, you know, in Pendragon, it's, you know, you have one quick adventure and then there's a winter phase, which is when you will take care of your estate. In this, it's called the fellowship phase. And so you will do whatever it is you need to do. You'll kill some monsters in Mirkwood. You'll save a little village. And then you go home. And there's a fellowship phase. And there are fellowship actions you can take. And over the course of a long campaign, and it's really beautifully designed for campaign play, uh, you're going to have um, the chance to meet new people, such as Bjorn or the Elven King or Radagast or you know the King Under the Mountain all of these kind of major characters, and then you can use them for fellowship actions and do kinds of stuff for that. Um, <laughs> and DZ and Duke, I absolutely am going to be putting this on YouTube. It'll be up on YouTube in an hour or two. It just takes a while to upload. So yes, you will be able to watch this later if you're not able to watch it all right now. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, by the way, I record these live on Twitch and you can join in the chat like this guy just did. Anyway, uh, the fellowship actions are a chance for you to kind of grow your character over time. And the fellowship action can be, well, I want to get better at X thing. I want to be better at traveling. Well, then you need to talk to this person. Or I want to gain an extra boon of some kind. Well, okay, well, then you need to talk to a different person. Um, and so they are a nice role-playing mechanic, and they're a nice... Um, growth and experience and leveling mechanic just really some the whole system comes together uh with the way the dice work with the way hope and fellowship works with uh the way that um travel works so that it does feel very much like you're in middle earth it's not just a middle earth themed D, &D adventure it really is a lord of the rings middle earth game. Uh, so one of the basic scenarios that you'll play, for example, um, in the, uh, I don't think this is the core book adventure, but one of the first ones we did, we all started in Bjorn's house, and then we had to come all the way down here to this kind of Western Eves area uh, to help. Uh, there was a, a rider of Rohan that had come up from the, from the south and uh, lost you know, we found the horse, but not the guy. And we're like, well, crap, we got to go find the guy. Uh, the horse wandered in. And so we took care of the horse and then went back down and did some investigation, talked to the people who lived in the little village. I think it might have been this little woodsman town here. And then had to journey into the dangerous part over here, into the heart of Mirkwood to, uh, you know, to find what happened to this guy. And eventually found him dead and killed a spider and a troll and brought his body back and you know, and that's basically all the first one was, uh, but that gave us a chance to learn how the travel system works, to learn how the fellowship system works, and then uh, we got to take a fellowship action, uh, and and that started to expand the scope of the game, and we realized, oh well, we don't know enough of the, you know, every every new haven that you gain access to, you know, once you make friends with the Elven King or with the people in Eskaroth or with the King Under the Mountain, or if you go over here and find Rivendell, you make friends with Elrond, then you gain access to more havens and that gives you more fellowship actions. And so it gives you a nice incentive to explore and to do some extra things that way. Um, really just a great game. 
and I also love, as you can see, the, uh, the art style for it. I mean, these are just fantastic. Um, let's look at some of these character, the character art here, so you can really see what it looks like. Um, where are you? I love the this this one. I'm a sucker for any character class that comes with a pet. <laughs> and if you play one of the woodmen of Wilderland, uh, like this one, she's called the Bride. Um, then you you can have a dog that follows you around like a big hunting dog. So it's really cool. Um, anyway, I don't uh, want to take too much more time except to say this game is beautiful. I love it. It comes with so many supplements and a gorgeous long campaign uh, that uses this fellowship action system that uses all of this other stuff um, to, you know, play out what's basically the darkening of Mirkwood and the fall of Mirkwood as the power of Sauron rises again. And so it's a little bit of a tragedy, which again fits so beautifully with the books. Um, but you can play it out over years and years to the point that by the end of the campaign, you might be playing your character's child uh, or grandchild because you play through all of those 60 whatever years in between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Uh, so anyway, before we go, one more system that I uh, want to tell you about, okay? which is the fellowship uh, points. There are fellowship points that a party has access to, which is basically just one point for every member of the group. So if you got four people in your party, then you have four fellowship points. You can spend fellowship points to gain some hope back. And um, your hope points do not automatically replenish, but your fellowship do at the end of every session. And so, um, one of the great things about the game, though, is that when you spend a fellowship point, since it's a communal pool of them, you have to get everyone else's permission. And so if the rest of the group says, yes, spend a fellowship point, gain your hope back, then that's great, and you do, and you're fine. If you don't get everyone else's permission, you can still do it anyway, but then you gain a shadow point. And shadow points make it harder and harder. It, it make it more likely for you to become hopeless. It kind of raises the floor at which you will just become miserable and, and that your hope will run out. And so it, it's sort of a corruption thing. And it's a nice way of saying, look, uh, the group, you, you took too many of the group's resources. And now the group is starting to turn and you are becoming a more selfish person. Uh, the other great thing about the fellowship system is that each character will have a fellowship focus, which is kind of just like a Legolas Gimli kind of relationship or Merry and Pippin. You've got a best friend in the group and when and, and then there are two things that come with that. First of all, if your fellowship focus becomes wounded, then bad things will happen to you. And if your fellowship focus straight up dies, then horrible things will happen to you. You'll start gaining shadow points, you'll start becoming miserable and weary and all these extra things. But you can spend, when you spend your hope points to help your fellowship focus, something that directly helps them, heals them, supports them, saves them from an attack or from a whatever, then you will gain that hope back. And so it's just a nice way of saying, look, hope and fellowship are really what matter in this game. Yes, you're traveling through dungeons. Yes, you're fighting spiders and trolls. But what really matters is the friendships that you have with each other and your ability to stave off weariness and build up and maintain your hope in the face of darkness. And that's why I think this is such a great, wonderful Lord of the Rings game. I encourage you to give it a shot. One of the worst bits of news that I received in December uh, was that uh, Cubicle 7, the company that makes this game, lost the license. They were about to come out with a second edition of the game and then through, I still don't know why, some kind of corporate machination beyond their control, 
they lost the license. I assume what happened is that there's the Amazon series coming out, and so whoever owns the license thought they could get more money somewhere else. I have no idea. That's pure speculation on my part. What that means is that this game is not going to get any more supplements and that the supplements that are out there, you can grab. Uh, the entire run was on a Humble Bundle for in PDF uh, a couple of weeks ago. You could have gotten the entire game, like every supplement in the line for 20 or 30 bucks. Um, you can find them now, and I would encourage you to do so. If this video made you say, yes, I want to try that game, go out, grab the PDFs now, try to find the physical books now, uh, because who knows how much longer it'll be around. And it's the kind of game that even, you know, even with it not being actively supported because they lost the license, I will still be playing this for years to come because it is that great of a game. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, and uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this. Let's uh, give you a nice, great final image of that beautiful cover. There you go. Anyway, you're awesome. Thanks for watching. And uh, I'll talk to you later. Bye.